Greetings and welcome to Outlaws to the End. This is the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com and I am Brent Adams, joined now and always by Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren, welcome back. Boy, it has been a spell, hasn't it? <laughs> it has been a spell, Brent. And it makes me think now and always, are, are you and I going to be putting out occasional podcasts when we're 72? I hope so. I hope that uh, I hope that we are able to maintain throughout our entire lives. I, Although I, to I, be fair, since uh, you know, I don't know how much of an achievement it would be since seventy two is right around the corner. But um, <laughs> uh, to be honest, Brent, I got to tell you, lately I've been looking around and I've been wanting to listen to podcasts about gaming, and and not for nothing, but I cannot find a decent fucking podcast about gaming like anywhere, and it, it makes me want to start making podcasts again if, yeah. if for no other reason. So we have decent content to listen to. Well, that's awfully nice of you to say about y- yourself and I, I, <laughs> and me as well. I mean, I, actually, I was I hoping I, I, I was hoping you would start up Epic, Epic Battle Axe again. That was my hope. But I would I would love to. Uh, nothing nothing would make me happier. Um, and you know the other thing, Brent, is we're here to talk about E three, uh, which which is going on right now as we speak. But um, there's I, I I have all sorts of games I've been playing to talk about. I've been playing Detroit Become Human. I finished God of War. I started playing. Yeah. Alienation, which is a couple years old, but amazing. I have all these games I want to talk about, but um, I don't know. Maybe we should do more shows. Although I think our audience has probably dwindled to about six at this point. Yeah, but they want. But those six want us to do more shows. That's true. That is true. And um, uh, for the time being, anyway. I mean, you're getting a hundred percent more so- shows than you were this time last month. So <laughs> there's that's that. exactly right. And there's a lot to talk about. So I'm excited to talk about it with you, Brent. It's so good to be back here with you. And um, you too, and, man. And to talk about and talk about E three, E three is very exciting. Although I wish more people would put out games immediately after the show. But I, I, yeah, I have to say, I, I really, I appreciate the fact that uh, that some people are beginning to follow in that in that pattern. I, I, I always think of uh, Bethesda and Fallout Shelter, and what a what a neat sort of jewel in the rough that game ended up being. And yep. and I, I, whenever people do that, I'm always kind of reminded, like, aha. I mean, I know Bethesda is not the first one to do it, but I'm always reminded of Fallout Shelter just because that was uh, that was such a cool moment and such a cool game. Yeah, it seems like the new thing is uh, is to put out games in February of 2019. Yeah, that does. I, I don't know if you noticed it. That seems to be a popular window, doesn't it? I don't it? know if you noticed it, but pretty much every game is coming out in February of 2019. <laughs> every game that's got a date is coming out in February 2019. That's right. Um, uh, which is to say, you know, October. <laughs> that's but exactly. anyway, um, all right. So should we jump into? Uh, it still works. Should we jump into E3, man? Yeah, let's get into it. So I guess we're just going to go through. We're going to go through chronologically, and we're just going to talk about the press conferences and the games, and uh, see how things shook out for us. And then I, I suppose if if we have any final thoughts, we'll share those as well. But first thoughts, uh, we're going to go with EA. Uh, EA went first on. I can't. Re- was it sun- Saturday night or Sunday morning? It was Saturday. Okay, so. EA went on Saturday. I didn't watch it live, and uh, they had uh, they had a lot to talk about. Obviously, you know EA's got some big they got some big franchises that they want to plug, both new and old. Uh, they're talking up Battlefield Five. They're talking up uh, the cha- you know e- even more new changes in content and stuff for Battlefront Two. And then of course, game that we got a peek at. Uh, I guess it was last year at E3, and we got to see a bit more of this time is Anthem. So. What, uh, let's start with Anthem, I guess, since I, I think that's probably the biggest headline uh, coming out of the EA press conference. What do you think? Have have they have they got you interested with what they've shown off of Anthem so far? Is it just is it just you know Destiny but released by EA? What what's what's kind of your take on it? Yeah, so I've kind of gone back and forth with this one. When I first saw the the um, Anthem announce last year, I was extremely excited by it. Um, I, I have to say that what I saw at EA's press conference this year uh, took me in the other direction. I, it wasn't very compelling. Yeah, um, I, I did feel like it looked like a, a de- sort of a Destiny reskin. I mean, the game the game's beautiful. Don't get me wrong, um, but I, I was a little and the the movement with the flying looks interesting. Yeah, but other than that, it sort of felt like a Destiny reskin with a little kind of almost with a splash of Borderlands with that sort of arcadey. You know, when you're shooting and numbers are just flying all over the screen kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, that does call to mind Borderlands, doesn't it? Um so I and it just more than anything it wasn't sort of interesting or compelling. I mean, it's not my my goal to sort of compare it to another game, but I don't know, it just it, it wasn't compelling to me. And then I will say that 
Um, somebody just posted on our site today a link to a video made by Skill Up, mm-hmm. who did a lot of content, who's done a lot of content around um, the Division Two and Warframe, among others. Um, and he does a lot of great, great reviews. He posted, um, uh, I guess he's got another channel with his brother called Layman Gaming, I guess. Okay. Um, and they posted a video saying they got a behind the scenes look of a 20 minute gameplay demo that was played by EA. They, they weren't playing it themselves, but. Um, and he said it completely turned around um, his perspective on Anthem and that he's totally interested in it now. And he, he was, he just, he spent a lot of the videos saying he didn't understand why EA presented what they presented at the press conference and didn't present what they're presenting behind closed doors because the latter was so much more compelling. Ah, I see. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I, I got to say, as far as Anthem is concerned, you know, it's like there's nothing they've shown about it that I dislike. Like, there's nothing that I look at and say, I, you know, I roll my eyes and say, oh, I don't want to fucking play that. Yep. There's nothing that they've done to push me away from it, but I, I, I've not had any moment with it. Like, I, I can remember in years past watching, you know, either gameplay demos that they've done on stage or, or hearing people talk about playing it afterwards. But I haven't had that moment yet where, there's been a moment that I that immediately captures my imagination, and and I say, oh, that like I want to have that experience. Like I want to play with I want to play with the guys and have that experience. That sounds so fun. The way that I did, you know, with you know, you know, like the Division or Rainbow Six Siege or you know, whatever, the, the, those games that I have really gotten into. Uh, I, I've not had that moment with Anthem yet. It's not to say that it couldn't happen at some point down the line, but there's just. I don't know. There's not been some unique thing that they've shown about it that has really just demanded uh, demanded my my interest in the way that in the way that I would like to have experienced. So yeah, I agree with that. I'm I mean, still, I'm open. I'm open I'm still, if something yeah, does. That's, it, that's exactly how I feel. I'm I'm open to to be convinced on it, but it just hasn't happened yet. I I, I agree with that a hundred percent. Uh, this that's that's why we make such good podcasts right there because we completely agree with each other. That's right. So I think you're going to completely agree with me that who gives a fuck about Battlefield Five? Uh, right? I cannot right? agree more. Damn it! Except Damn it. that I don't agree with you at all. I knew I knew you were lying to me. So yeah, so we're actually, talking about this shit whether you like it or not. Cool. Okay. L- like honestly, <laughs> like Battlefield Five looks cool. Like it's not like I don't think it's a game I'm really into, but it did look cool. Yeah, I, I gotta say. So I'll talk. I, I'll try not to go on too long about Battlefield Five. I know I'll it's time a, you. I know it's not a game that you're particularly into, but um, as a Battlefield fan, I played Battlefield One. Um, I, I was uh, sort of cool on it. I mean, it was okay. I liked it, but it didn't grab me the way the previous titles had. Yeah. Uh, Battlefield Five. Things that are really interesting to me. Number one, and first and foremost, they got rid of the premium pass in an effort not to divide the community, so there'll no longer be a premium pass. All subsequent map packs and modes will be available to the entire community. Significant. Which I, think is, which I think is very significant. We saw that in another game at E3 as well. Um, uh, number two, uh, the destruction. They have ramped up the destruction a little bit more like Battlefield Bad Company 2, the game that, that many people largely consider to be the best in the series. Yeah. Um, and then they have included some new improvements, which I think are very interesting. Uh, most notably, movable defense uh, weaponry, so anti-aircraft guns and the like can be moved around the battlefield using tanks and stuff like that to pull them, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Uh, they also are limiting the amount of ammo uh, in tanks and vehicles, and you can resupply on the level. It doesn't mean that once you're out of ammo that the vehicle is useless, but they're limiting the amount of, of ammo in it, which means you, you're you less likely to, to go 54 and 0 by driving a tank through the, um, you know, through the battlefield constantly and just right. just hammering on people, which I think is interesting. I think, uh, that's, I think that's a cool, and, and I just sort of like the realism of it. Like, I, I think that that's that's a cool way of balancing it in sort of a a, a non artificial way. Like, like to me, like balancing it in that way, you know, within a context that makes sense within either you know, sort of like the the Ludo narrative or you know, whatever. Uh, just you know, just the scenario of gameplay seems makes like some a good, sense. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. So they so. Other other things that they've done is they've given everybody the ability to heal your own squad mates. Mm-hmm. So every class can heal, but only your own squad mates, and it's kind of slow. And when they revive, they have only a small percentage of health, whereas a medic can heal anybody, and they revive to 100% health. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's an interesting change. And then one of the other really interesting things is what they call squad reinforcement. So if you're actually to try and encourage squad play and playing the objective, if you're actually doing things as a squad, you will earn 
sort of, I, I don't know what they're called, squad bucks, squad points, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. And, and as that builds up over the course of a match, if you get to a certain threshold, you can call, call in squad reinforcements, which is sort of a, a, an uber power, powerful vehicle that nobody else can get into. Only you guys can get into it. Uh, and it's more powerful than most vehicles. And so it really encourages squad play and objective play, which I think is super interesting. So they're doing, um, they're doing, and then there's some other stuff, fortifications. You can rebuild buildings that are destructed, stuff like destroyed, stuff like that. Um, so, so it's really interesting. I mean, I, I think what they're doing is definitely interesting. It's piqued my interest for sure. And, and, and without the need to, you know, I've spent $100 on this game all of the last three iterations by buying the premium pass so I could get all of the maps. Yeah. Uh, and not having to do that at 60 bucks right now, this, for me, this looks like a no brainer and I am at least intrigued and, and appreciate the effort of them to try, try new things, try and fix some of the issues that uh, have existed in previous battlefield games. And I think it looks great, man. Yeah. I, I have to say, even though I'm not particularly a, a battlefield fan, it's not a game that I'm looking to get. I, I have to say that I, I was enthusiastic about what they were showing on the, on behalf of people who are, fans of battlefield people like yourself i thought oh that, that's that's pretty cool and i i cannot help but wonder if some of the the things that they are doing such as eliminating that premium pass i wonder if that might not have something to do with some of the enthusiastic and verbose feedback they've gotten on star wars battlefront 2 which if you thought the mea culpa for battlefront 2 was over you were wrong there was still more apologizing to do at E3, which EA did, uh, loud and clear was sort of the, that was sort of the message. We hear you loud and clear. You are really, really angry. We really, really fucked up. We are so sorry. Please give us your money again. Um, not to be entirely cynical about it. I, I do think that, I do think that particularly the developers, I don't know about EA management, but particularly the developers of Battlefront 2, I think that they want to make a game that people like. I don't think they want to be known as the developers of the most vile or reviled and hated game uh, in modern in history. Yeah, in right. modern gaming history, yeah. yeah right. But um, it's just it, it is it is interesting to sort of see a company that big, the different ways that they are pivoting to try to, I guess, uh, regain the enthusiasm and and the trust of of their customers. But anyway. Uh, I, I having said that, didn't pay attention to anything Battlefront two related. I've I've kind of checked out of that. I'm not really. Well, I do really wonder, Brent. I mean, it, I have to wonder. But, I, I, one of the things I was thinking about while they were up there was, are people are people still playing this game? Like, are there enough people still playing the game that it really, like, financially, like it warrants them doing what they're doing? Are they sort of right. doing this because they committed to it and are stuck with it now? It's an interesting question. I and I don't know. And you, know, in truth be told, I would rather. The answer B, it's because people are playing the game. I would rather it be Absolutely. because EA fixed it and people gave it a chance and discovered, hey, it's it's pretty good actually. And truthfully, which it, we've seen, which we've seen from Ubisoft time and time again in the last two or sure. three years, Rainbow is actually Six Siege. is actually <laughs> possible. You can yeah. the Division Two also. Sure. I mean, well, I mean you, but I mean, Siege was a joke. I mean, Siege came. I mean, you remember like I saw it at E3 and I said that looks pretty fun, and you were like, yeah, whatever. And I think a lot of people had that ah whatever sort of attitude about Siege, and that like that game. Look how that fucking game is blown up now. It's huge. right because because they put the work into fixing it. Exactly right. Right. So exactly it is. I mean, right. it is possible for sure. And so, I, honestly, I would rather that be the scenario with EA. I don't wish them to fail. I would rather have a really fun game to play rather than just have the sort of visceral joy of being able to laugh at EA failing. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's fun. I mean, that would be fun, but I'd rather have the fun game to play. So, let's talk about a Star Wars game that got just a tiny little bit of lip service. An odd bit of lip service from the crowd. <laughs> uh, honest, honestly, it was, it, like, that was a very strange segment. I think that they were... I think that was a very conscious decision, too, on their part to say, listen, we're not showing any gameplay. We're not even showing a fucking logo. So there is no reason to do this up on screen. Like, if, right, if so let's talk, to Vince, Sam, let's talk yeah, to Vince Zampella in the audience. In the audience. If we have anybody up on stage and we don't have a gameplay trailer, we don't have a logo or you know anything like that. I mean, Bethesda would have... They're, they're, this is EA saying to themselves. I mean, if Bethesda was going to you know talk about a game that they don't even, they're not even going to show anything for, they'd have the good decency to put up a logo, at least, on screen. You know, We're not doing that. Anyway... That joke will almost, I mean, it'll almost make sense later. Not going to be funny later, but 
<laughs> but but at least makes sense. But it'll at least make sense later. Um, but yes, that was weird. Talking uh, so they talked to Vince uh, Zampella from Respawn about the Star Wars game that Respawn is doing, which is Star Wars colon Jedi Fallen Order. And I think the details that emerged from that very canned conversation were it's set between episodes three and four in the timeline. It's during the period of time where the Jedi are actively being hunted by the Empire and you're going to play as a Jedi. And that's pretty much what we got. Yep. Um, I have not forgiven EA for canceling the 13, Amy 13. Hennig involved visceral yep. uh, Star Wars game. Uh I was really, really looking forward to that. That sounded like something that was going to be right up my alley. And uh, the fact that we're not getting that is is pretty disappointing. Yeah, it's hard to think about. It's hard to. It's, it's interesting to think about uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order in the context of Respawn's last and only game, really, or two game series, Titanfall. Um, yeah, Titanfall. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, it. it, it uh, you know, without more information. You know, I mean, they uh, look. I like Titanfall. I thought Titanfall was very well done. You know, there, Vincent, Vincent, um, what's his partner's name? I can't remember. I popped my head. I can't um, remember on there. Uh, made great. You know, ma- we're making Call of Duty games for a while. I mean, they're certainly skilled game makers. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It'll be curious. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. But there's just obviously nothing yeah. here to to even grasp onto. It's true. It, it's it's not necessarily fair to say. It's not maybe not necessarily fair to judge a game that's going to come out by the game that they've already done. Because they may they may bear no semblance to each Absolutely. other in terms of Absolutely. gameplay, yep. but it's difficult to not it's difficult to not judge people by what they've done before and by that pedigree. And just going by the pedigree of Respawn Entertainment versus Visceral Games and, and Amy Hennig uh, individually, I was much more interested in what they were going to do. So right, I, I mean, you're just talking about probably probably two very different games instead of yeah, games. exactly. And uh, it's not to say that this game couldn't be interesting or fun or you know. I don't know. You know, maybe it'll be you know like the maybe it'll be like the you know the old Jedi Knight PC games. Maybe it'll be awesome. I don't know, but I, I guess I'm gonna have to try to keep an open mind about that because I do feel, I guess, still a little bit burned. Maybe. So, Brent, I want to talk about one more thing before we leave EA. All right, uh, and that is the the announcement of Origin Access Premiere. Yeah. So, Origin Access, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is a is a service where you can pay a subscription fee and you get access to a library of Origins titles. Um, There's many services like this out there uh, for people who haven't, you know, who who don't consistently play, um, uh, you know, keep up with the newest titles. It's actually probably a very good value. There's some some really good titles in there for a very reasonable reasonable amount of money if you haven't played the games. Um, But Origin Access Premier is sort of a step up from that. Uh, in which they uh, are offering a service, a subscription service, which I did not. I, did you see Brent anywhere? I saw, I saw no allusion to what it, what Origin Access Premier is going to cost. No, I didn't see price mentioned either. And, um, and they may have they may have put out a press release, but I haven't gone and looked. I for still it. haven't seen it anywhere. But but Origin Access Premier is essentially a similar thing. It's it's a um, subscription fee to play games, but it will include um, day one day one playing of new release games and and right. It's odd the way the way they the way they sort of painted the picture was they they didn't say all games, but but they said certainly these two or three games and I don't remember what they were off the top of my head, but but they were huge um, flagship games that they're releasing and so I'm not sure why like what would differentiate which games would be available and which games wouldn't but and maybe it's you know EA first first party EA published titles versus other games because they do have other games on their store. Um, but it's an interesting concept. Again, I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't know what the value is, but presuming you know each new game you buy is sixty bucks, um, if you're you're playing two or three of those brand new games day day and date, um, it may well be worth it. And more importantly, is is to see if this is the harbinger of uh, where some of the industry is going. Yeah, I I I can definitely see that. I mean it. Uh... It it makes a lot of financial sense when you have as big a catalog as EA that this is this is one way that you can leverage that uh, that catalog into um, you know into maybe new revenue streams. So I definitely get the appeal for them. As far as the appeal for gamers, obviously you know they've got to they've got to offer some compelling value. One thing that I have a question on because I was only half watching at that point when they were talking about it. Does 
Origin Access Premiere, does that involve any kind of game streaming service? Uh, I, uh that's a good question. I don't I don't believe it does. Okay. Yeah. Just curious because I I I, I thought for a second uh that that is where they were they were going with this and um that would have that would have been kind of an interesting um an interesting thing. I'm just reading something on Rock Paper Shotgun here. It looks like they are quoting now from this Rock Paper Shotgun article. EA also explained that they're moving into PlayStation Now space by working towards cloud gaming, streaming HD games, even to mobile devices. That's separate from Access Premiere. Okay, so anyway, I guess that that's what I heard. I guess that I heard them saying, oh, we, we're kind of moving in that direction, but that apparently is not part of Origin Access Premiere. Okay, so anyway, that's just wanted to clear up my own confusion, which actually... We could spend an entire episode trying to clear up my own confusion. <laughs> Let's move on to the Microsoft press conference, which I, I got to say that in the grand scheme of things, in terms of what I sort of think of as an EA press, or excuse me, in terms of what I think of as a big honking E3 press conference, Microsoft definitely delivered that, particularly when compared to Sony, but... Uh, Microsoft, they really, really brought out the big guns this year. They had a lot of announcements. They had a lot of world premiere content. They showed off a lot of big games. And uh, and, and generally all around, I, I felt like they threw their weight around pretty effectively at E3 2018, starting with and the biggest gun that they probably have, which is Halo in this, uh, this new Halo Infinite. So... What'd you think, Lauren? I can't, I, have you ever gotten into Halo? I, I remember you liked that one that everybody else hated. ODST, that's right. Yeah, um, ODST. That was I mean, I've, pl- I've played all the Halo games since Halo uh, 4, 3. I mean, yeah. I, I, didn't, I wasn't in on the original Xbox, but uh, right. I think I started playing Halo around 3, and I do play them all, and I like them, and I enjoy them, but they're not, you know, for some people, they're, they're, they're just uh, like... Uh, it's like their it represents their childhood, their youth. Right. It's, it's like one of their. It was a big game. moment in the gaming. It's and, nothing yeah. like that for me. I mean, I'm interested in the world. I find it interesting. This trailer, I, I you know, I, because I don't have that emotional tie to it. This trailer wasn't meaningful to me because there was nothing in this trailer. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm glad to see they're working on a new Halo. It comes as no surprise that Microsoft would be working on a Halo. They they probably will be for the rest of my natural born life. Um. So yeah, I mean it was it was interesting. I'm excited to see more. Okay, yeah, that, I, that's, that's about as deep as it goes for me. Honestly, I really yeah, that's 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 me too. I mean, I I'm like great for the Halo fans. Probably a good move for Microsoft. I mean, I I think that I think that the it's, in terms of the conversation between Microsoft versus Sony, I I think that in recent years that really has has boiled down to at least for you and I that Sony has the exclusive games that we want to play. And I think that Microsoft also feels that they've been deficient on having exclusive titles, which is why they're buying up like five fucking studios that they were they were talking about in their yeah, press right, conference. Yeah, right, which is a big deal in the conference, including it, big studios like Ninja Theory. Yeah, yeah. Big, big quote-unquote. Obviously, Microsoft feels like they need to do some improving in their exclusive title lineup, and I think that it makes a lot of sense to... You know, to put things like Halo at the very front of the press conference, things that they already have under their belt that they know people like. So yeah, it's a it's a good time. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things that Microsoft showed in this press conference. Third party titles that they say feature. I can't remember the exact turn of phrase they use, but something like, and you know, 15 of these titles have exclusivity. Something like that. They have exclusivity, which I think is their way of saying not saying. It's a timed exclusive, which in the past they've they've said, and it's going to be exclusive on Xbox for two weeks, and that turns out to not be such a bragging point. So they've backed off that a little bit. But anyway, so some of these things not going to be exclusive to the Xbox, but that's okay. One of the things that really surprised me, and I suppose maybe if I'd read more press coverage, it wouldn't have, but I didn't I didn't see Devil May Cry Five coming from any direction. That was. A really really cool surprise yeah i so I, I you know i have again i haven't been a big fan of the series necessarily until the last one yeah just which was just well, dmc oh yeah well, so now like i like the old like i like you know like 
Devil May Cry, like one and two, and you know. Yeah, I just had never played them. I, I mean, like it's those. just it's something I had never come across, and I I, I don't know why it just wasn't. Or that and, was in your PC exclusive years. I think it's possible, and and I'm not, and I also well, and I did take a break on off of the Xbox uh, and gaming in general before the 360. There was about a five year period right before the 360 that I kind of stopped gaming. Yeah, um, but um, uh, it was a series I had never encountered, and then I played D- I picked up DMC. A game that typically I, I I wouldn't pick up. It's not really my style of game necessarily, um, yeah. and I absolutely fucking loved it. I loved it. I I, I really yeah. and I know a lot of people may, maybe didn't love the game, particularly people that were small no, wars of the it's series. It's the ODST of the Devil May Cry franchise. Yeah, right. And I understand. I totally get that. I get if you've been playing the franchise, this game is isn't what you would expect. But I hadn't been, and so I really enjoyed it. So yeah. I, I'm actually excited to see uh, what the next devil may cry will bring i, I mean there, i know there were some people making fun of the main character i don't know what his name is but but uh I, yeah i'm interested man i'm intrigued to see it i absolutely am i had heard I, there had been rumors about this um showing up at e3 so i wasn't totally surprised by this all right um were you totally uh, surprised that gears of war made an appearance <laughs> another one I, so I, this is another one of those franchises brent and, and you know the for our listeners who have been listening to year over year this, uh, you know, they're probably we rolling their eyes. Ourselves. Right, they're probably rolling their eyes, but I could give a shit about Gears of War. So I, I wasn't, <laughs> it's, it's just, I, it's, I, I, there's nothing about this series that has ever interested me. I, I don't think it's a well-designed series of games. I know that's, that breaks from the norm. But, um, so I, I am 100% not surprised to see it there, and I 110% couldn't care less. Yeah, if you're into Gears of War, congratulations. Hope it's good. Okay, something that we do give a shit about is the Just Cause franchise. Yeah, dude. And Rico is back, motherfuckers. Yeah, so this one, this and the next game we're going to talk about were both surprises for me. And yep. probably the two best surprises for me. Um, so Just Cause 4, which I am super, super excited about. I'm a little cautious about the fact that it's not Avalanche Studios making it. Right. Um, but I fucking loved the Just Cause games. Uh, and Just Cause 3 wasn't quite as good as Just Cause 2, and so maybe it'll end up being a good thing that they've handed it off to another yeah. studio. It'll, um, be, it'll be like the Star Trek movies, you know, like the even ones will be the, the ones that everybody loves. <laughs> That's exact. That could be. I hope so, man, because it looks... It, I love Rico. I love the games. I love the aesthetic and the feel of the games and the sort of just fun nature of grappling random shit together. And um, and, and so I was really, I was not expecting a Just Cause game here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I, and I didn't see, there was a small leak like the day before, um, but I hadn't seen it. And so I, I was just, I was giddy when I saw this one. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I think, I think, you know, in a lot of respects, the trailer kind of does everything that you expect a just cause game to do, but you know, just a, a little, a little gameplay, a little massive destruction and just that, you know, the just cause games have just that really over the top kind of action movie sort of sensibility that that just makes them so fun. I think it I think it sets them apart and is also what makes them so so fun to play. And you know, just a little dash of that and I think I think they're going to be set. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. The next the, the next game Brent that really got me going that was a that was a complete surprise for me. Yeah, and that could not have made me happier was dying the announcement of Dying Light too, right? Um, I thought of you instantly. Oh man, did I? Did you? I can't remember. Did you play or no? I did. I I play. I played Dying Light, not to completion. I mean, I played it a little bit. You um, and you didn't have the re- the same reaction that I did. No, I didn't really get into it so much. Yeah. So um, I I absolutely I absolutely loved the original Dying Light. I've gone back and played through it almost, uh, uh not not a second time, but halfway through it a second time. I think it was a great, great game, and uh, so I'm really excited. A about a Dying Light too. Yep. B uh, apparently they've got a, a a writer who's got a, a long history as a writer and designer on games like Knights of the Old Republic, two Fallout, two. Uh, his name is Chris Avalone. He's going to be the narrative designer. But the game itself, it looks like, is is taking some some real um, different directions in terms of how choice impacts the world. Uh, which is something that they didn't have in the first one, so I'm intrigued by that. Um, but uh, re- I'm just clamoring to hear a little bit more about Dying Light 2. This this was probably uh, my number one sort of happiest surprise at E3. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, it wasn't much of a surprise, but probably my favorite part of the, the Microsoft press conference was The Division 2. 
uh, just because the Ubisoft press conference hadn't happened yet. But, uh, you know, you and I talked about the division. We both played the, the beta. We both played the game. We talked about it. There's episodes of Outlaws to the end all about what we thought of the division. And despite its flaws and despite the fact that it, it was a game that really, really evolved quite a bit over the course of time that I was playing it and, and continued to evolve after I stopped playing it. Uh, I'm very, very interested to see Ubisoft take the lessons learned and implement some new ideas, a new location, Washington, D.C., This, in this case, and to see what they do with a sequel to The Division. The Division had a lot of things going for it. There were a lot of things that that game did right. It was very, very fun in multiplayer, and I think that there's a, an enormous amount of potential for a sequel to really capitalize on all the things it did right and to tweak the things that it didn't do right initially. But I'm ex- I'm excited for The Division too. I, I love the game, the first game, too much to not be excited for what could happen in a follow-up. Yeah, you, you put, w- w- what, probably over 200... 200- 250 hours or something yeah i i think it was like 263 or something like i think it's in that neighborhood i can't remember for sure but it was a lot and i was i was up near there too so i so my reaction to this was a few things brent Uh, so super excited i can't wait to get back into i love the world and the lore of the division yeah uh and i can't wait to get back into that world and to get back into it with friends i mean it was a really a really great game to play with friends and a really easy game to hop in and out of um, with friends or without um i know you and i played together some you had a group of four guys that you played with regularly oh yeah man neil lance Fatui, and me yep. yeah i mean the, the division was our jam yeah and i'm hoping to i'm hoping to uh do some more of that with you you know they're adding raids uh yeah with with up to eight players and so hopefully That's we'll get fantastic. to all of us will get to play more together doing raids which i think will be just absolutely fucking awesome yeah um they're they're really it's clear that they're really focused on end game. They've created basically a whole system of specialization and customization that doesn't even begin until the end game, uh, which I think is which I think is fantastic. Um, the my my only concern was, and it might just be a little bit of you know shell shock from j- just that sort of uh, you know aversion to change that that human beings have in general. I was I was a little put off by the setting. I was bu- I was actually a little bummed. I I wanted them to stay in New York and expand the New York maps, but um, but um, I wasn't moved by what I saw in Washington D.C. And I particularly was was a little disappointed in the season they chose. I wish they would have chosen a season that is at least aesthetically a bit more interesting. Either spring, which is cherry blossom season in D.C., or fall, uh, which I think would have had a little more character to it. Um, as I watched more footage and they're, they're doing a lot of demos today and tomorrow, which is, we're recording this on Tuesday, um, which I hope to watch. Um, I I became a little bit more accustomed to it, but it was, it was very jarring for me, the whole sort of lush green aesthetic. Um, and I've never been to Washington DC. And so maybe part of it is that, that, you know, I've spent a lot of time in New York city. And so I was able to tell how representative and real it felt. Right. Uh, whereas in Washington D.C., I'm not maybe uh, quite as acquainted. So I did, I'm curious. Did you? What did you think of when you first saw, found out it was D.C. and first saw it in D.C.? Did that was it? Was it meaningful to you at all? Yeah, I have to say that that is evocative. And you know, I mean, I've visited D.C. probably five times, I guess, in my life. Uh, and so it, it's it's a city, at least sort of the, the more touristy spots like the National Mall and you know the Capitol Building, that kind of thing. Right, which is where this takes place, and that's right. Of, yeah. I, I'm I'm certainly familiar with uh, with those areas, and so yeah, I have to say that there there is an evocative kind of quality to you know realizing that these gun battles and and just the the gameplay is going to be in and around places that I have I have become familiar with over the course of my life, and I, I'm very interested to have that experience where you know whereas in the division I, I've never been to New York City, so I have absolutely no point of reference for that and so really for me i mean new york city is just a place i'm familiar with only through media and i i don't know how it'll feel to actually play it but it did get my interest now one thing that you said that i do agree with i found the the winter setting 
in New York City, very, very compelling. Something about seeing the results of winter in an urban area where human beings aren't doing what they normally do to maintain control over their environment against the forces of nature during the winter. Something about that quality of the division I found really compelling. And and also just the the ways that it necessitated certain things, like, you know, the big heavy coats that, you know, that people would wear, you know, that they'd be covering their faces and it just, it, it, uh, it, it created a little sense of foreboding you know, whenever you see people out in the distance or it's snowing really hard and you just see silhouettes kind of coming towards you, you're not sure are these, you know, good guys or bad guys or, you know, whatever there, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that they got from the winter setting that translated into either, either, gameplay or tone and i don't know what they're going to do as an analog for that in the division two yeah it should be interesting to see like i said there's more coverage on it today and tomorrow i'm looking i'm sure they're just replaying the you know some of the same areas but but yeah. um ubisoft the particularly the team that, that is doing the division is great about communicating with the community so i'm looking forward to it it comes out march 15th yeah of 2019 so basically february plus two weeks um <laughs> Which let's uh, be honest, they're probably not the only. They're probably not the only company that's going to be adding two weeks to February. Uh, that's I mean, right. Let's, let's that, be honest. That's right. There is a beta. If you're interested, you can sign up for the beta. You should go do it now. Um, but yeah, super excited about that one. All right. What did you think about this next one? Because I, I I thought this was one of the more interesting highlights in terms of new games, new franchises, stuff we haven't seen. What did you think about this one from from software? Um. For me, I, I, this is one I need to go back and watch. I, I wasn't really clear on what I was watching at the time. Right. Um, and I have, as, as I said uh, just a few minutes ago, Brent and I were recording this on Tuesday, um, kind of early in the afternoon. And so I really have only seen what I've seen live and haven't had a chance to go back and rewatch very much stuff. Uh, this is one I feel like I need to rewatch. I, you know, I really I liked Dark Souls uh, a lot, um, mm-hmm. but, but that's pretty much the only game that I, I, I wasn't big on Bloodborne. Um, I didn't play, I never finished any of the Dark Souls. I only played two of them, um, and never finished them. And, and I enjoy them. It, there's, there's something about them that is starting to feel samey to me. Um, and, and so this, this one didn't grab me, but I know it's personal. And I know from software is a, is a uh, an incredible developer. And I know that there's a ton of people that are, uh, are passionate about from software games. And I thought it, I was really excited that there was a new franchise announced from from software for folks yeah so Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the game that we're talking about I just realized I forgot to mention it at the top of this and it's it, it looks very interesting it's got sort of a I don't know Japan Middle Ages mythical fantasy kind of vibe to it yeah there were people in the chat room on discord and the EBA dis- or the EBA uh, on the uh, Outlaw I Gamers. I mean, let's, it's as close to an EBA Discord as there's likely to be. <laughs> That's true. On the Outlaw Gamers Discord, that kept calling out Tenshu, Tenshu. And I was like, no, this doesn't, this isn't Tenshu. And it better not be Tenshu because it's not Tenshu enough. Yeah. Um, but certainly it, it has that, you know, that sort of that same time frame in Japan aesthetic to it. Yeah. It, it, it's definitely interesting. I, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure what they're trying to get across and i think that this is what will come out today during gameplay demos and just people interviewing the developers and getting more information out of them i'm not quite sure what point they're trying to get across as far as how the death mechanic kind of works and but they are making a big point about that in the trailer i i I guess that my attitude about it right now having just seen what they showed at the microsoft presser i'm curious to see more because it, it definitely seems like there's some there's some interesting ideas that could be happening here, so to be continued, I guess. Uh, do we do we have to talk about Forza Horizon Four? No, the only reason I put it on there is because I thought you might care. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, much like Madden, NFL, and FIFA, I would have left it off. He's a funny guy. <laughs> He's a real funny guy. No, I don't care about Forza Horizon anything. Uh, four or otherwise. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I, I can kind of respect Forza, and, and and I, you know, I played Forza Four, and I'm, I kind of, you know, can respect those games, but Forza Horizon is definitely not my, uh, 
Jam. Oh wait, those are two different games. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, see, the Horizon fine. games are like that's like the for, that, that's like the Forza Need for Speed. Or now I got you. that split, makes split. way more sense now that I was watching the the trailer. I saw. I, I, don't think me an idiot. I really didn't realize that there were sort of two Forza franchises. Yeah, because I, I don't pay attention. I just truly don't pay attention. I was watching the trailer and I was like. <laughs> Wow, they really took Forza in like a, <laughs> in a, a much more arcadey direction, and yeah. I, I, and I actually was kind of curious to hear what your your take on that was because I was like, this does not feel like the same Forza that I'm used to, and that's why it's now. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Forza Horizon has, that's been sort of like their arc their arcadey, arcade-y version. And, that makes total sense. Dude. And then the the regular Forza games are you know they're kind of trying to inch their way a little bit more towards racing. The sound. same, yeah, right. I I totally get that. So let, we also don't need to talk about the next one, Brent, the Crackdown trailer except that a i had to point out it's also coming out in february the month of every video game or yes. or or that's when they've slotted it for it's never coming out i think we both know it <laughs> um, and b was just that it was here again and like it's coming out seven months from now which is i just find to be complete bullshit the only thing that's not bullshit in my opinion and, okay now bear in mind crackdown could be great i've never played a crackdown game i have no idea but uh crackdown could be great but the only thing about it that i find particularly noteworthy is of course the involvement of one Mr. Terry, Terry Crews. Cruz. Yeah, that's exactly right. I fucking love Terry <laughs> yeah, Crews yeah. and anything that he wants to get on board with, you know, I'll I'll at least support in spirit, if not in dollars. Yes, I agree with that. So, but I do want to, Brent, I want to talk about this next game. All only, right. be, only because I'm hoping you can shed some light onto me. No, light, there's, light no for me, there's no hope. No as to hope what that. the fuck this is. It's it's like, it's a, it seems like a game. So Kingdom Hearts 3 is yep. a game that I Kingdom Hearts is, is something I'd really never heard of until the last month or so. Okay. And and everybody seems to be clamoring for this Kingdom Hearts 3 and 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 then it came out and it is it it looks like a mishmash of like Disney animated characters. Yeah, so bear in mind this explanation of Kingdom Hearts is coming from a guy who's never played Kingdom Hearts, but okay. having said that, I'll take a swing at it. The Kingdom Hearts games uh it's basically Okay, so imagine sort of like a an old school Final Fantasy role playing game that stars a diverse collection of characters from the Disney universe, in addition to the like the, like the role playing game kind of characters. So it's it's a crossover between like these RPG characters and like the Disney characters and. It's. I, I've heard that the stories are actually quite good. I've never. I've never played one. I'm. I, you know, modern role playing games. I, I don't get into as much as I used to, but I've heard that the Kingdom Hearts games are pretty damn good. Which is why you saw the audience reacting the way they did to Kingdom Hearts Three is because these games have a reputation of being pretty boss. Do you know? Is it is it meant to be a kids game? Uh, I I think that it's probably okay for a younger audience but my impression is that it uh it, it's it's sort of good enough and cast a wide enough net that you know plenty of people of all different ages can get into Would these play games. yeah i mean i could look look i can i could see the appeal of like having bluto and olaf in the you know talking to each other um and, and that certainly there was a scene in there where where uh I, Elsa, I think, I think it was Elsa from uh, Frozen. Yeah. Uh, ask Olaf, like, these are your friends? And he's like, no, I don't have any friends that are green or blue or, you know, and it was completely humorous and I get it. I just, I, and I could see the interest in this game. I just was shocked at what seemed to me to be like this just overwhelming passion for this game. And it was like, it was like at every press conference. Yeah. It felt like. Yeah. It, it, I, I, I think it's because the, uh, the other two Kingdom Hearts games are so highly regarded. Okay. So again, I- you know, ask somebody that's played the games. I'm sure they can give you. I'm sure people who are listening right now that have played these games are smacking themselves in the forehead over my ham-fisted attempt to explain them. Well, and the fact that I'm not even aware of this, you know. Yeah. So anyway, they. I. I am at least that much cooler than you are. That's true. At least. Um, okay. So the only reason that this final title is not the highlight of the Microsoft E3 press event is because I saw it before the Microsoft E3 press event and, uh, and therefore it was not a surprise to me, but I got to tell you that had I not seen it before, had cyberpunk 2077 just been a big surprise in the middle of the Microsoft press event, this would have been, I mean, this would have been the one that brought the roof down for me. Um, like where do you start other than Holy shit. 
it's our first look at Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah, so I have a feeling you and I are going to have differing opinions here. Okay, well, I mean, let, let's bring it on, because, I mean, I'm nothing but excited for this. I got to tell you, man, I was just, dis- so this was the, the end of the Microsoft press conference. It was the very last thing. Yep. Um, and I I was disappointed by the trailer, to be honest with you, Brent. I'm not, I mean, I'm. Okay. What I, got you, what what was it that didn't work for you? Let's, let's distill it down. Yeah, I, and I can very easily. The, the, what really didn't, and, and I, before, let me just sort of uh, put a precursor here to, I'm still interested in the game and still very excited to see what it has to bring. And I have okay. nothing but respect for CD Projekt Red. And if anybody can make me interested in the game, it's going to be CD Projekt Red. So I'm not like abandoning the game or whatever. But but what what concerned me about the trailer is I was expecting something uh, much more uh, dark and noir. Yeah. Uh, based on what we had seen before, I was expecting something a lot more in the vein of Blade Runner and a okay. lot less in the vein of... Um, uh, you know grand theft auto uh, uh, not grand, grand theft auto i want to say rage is what i want to say right now because it's the most colorful thing i can think of but okay. the, the aesthetic of the world of the universe was extremely different than what i expected and the protagonist was felt like a sort of generic action hero protagonist when i was expecting something more of a gruff sort of like i said noir kind of uh feel to it and so the whole aesthetic of the world as it was presented in that trailer was 180 degrees different than what I was anticipating. I got you. I got you. So, so what you were expecting Cyberpunk 27, 2077 to look like was not this trailer. That, that's exactly right. And, and okay. it, it really, it caught me off guard. I, I, I went back and watched it. You know, I mean, I don't know if you remember, Brent, but, you know, the, like the, 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 so the voiceover work of the protagonist, who I presume is the protagonist, I don't actually know. Um, felt very generic to me, like a, a just a very generic L.A. action hero, Hollywood action hero, and and the last scene is him getting into this muscle car and driving away, and it, it just, um, it it just felt completely different, and it knocked me so far off kilter. I had to go back and watch the trailer again, and and I was able to find much more that I was interested in, but again, I I expected more of a gritty underworld of a of a dystopian sort of noir sci-fi future. And this one feels like a completely different direction. Right. So here's what got me excited about it is I watched this trailer and I said, holy shit, CD Projekt Red is going to make a Grand Theft Auto game. That's what I thought watching this trailer. Uh, (laughs) Because to me, the trailer and the world felt a lot like uh, like a Grand Theft Auto game or a Grand Theft Auto trailer. And in the same way that Grand Theft Auto trailers, it'll show you a moment where something is just happening on screen, like people playing pool in a bar, but that is a hint to you, the player that, you know, rockstar well enough to know that if you're seeing people playing pool in a bar, it means that you can go hang out in bars and play pool. And so they give you not just sort of the obvious things you'll be driving around and shooting and there'll be missions and blah, blah, blah. Um, not just that, But it gives you an idea of the world that you can inhabit and some of the activities you can engage in within that world. You know, there's people hopping into taxis to rob banks in this trailer. That's probably going to be that's a that's a thing that'll probably be in the game. That's that's a gameplay thing, probably a hint. So I'm thinking that CD Projekt Red is following a little bit of Rockstar's North Star and and incorporating some of those ideas into this trailer. I think that we're getting hints at a lot of different types of in-game things that we, we might be doing as far as the, the lack of a sort of blade blade runner tech noir sort of attitude. I agree. That's wholly absent in this trailer, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wholly absent in the game. If, if there's anything that CD project red demonstrated with the Witcher three, it's that they can they can create an incredibly compelling big open world like a living breathing world that is really really just fun to live in to to just explore and to and just have the experience of of inhabiting and i think that is maybe the single biggest thing that i am interested in because if this game follows that track with Witcher 3 of being this amazing compelling immersive open world then what happens within that world I feel like can be I think feel like there's a lot of diverse experiences that can happen within that, both the more actiony stuff that we're seeing in this trailer, as well as 
maybe more of the noir kind of uh, Blade Runner feel that they've hinted at prior. Yeah, I would like to believe that. And I agree with you, Brent. That's why I said at the beginning, uh, I, I have all the, I mean, Witcher 3 was a transcendent experience. It really, Indeed. I mean, the amount of st- the storytelling and world building was, was, was beyond almost anything I've ever experienced in video games. And so it's that, profound. that buys them a, a tremendous amount of goodwill with me. And so um, I, I, I'm still all in for this game. And, and yeah. even if even if the world is more like what we saw in the trailer and less like what I had hoped it would be, I'm still a hundred percent in because I'm I'm convinced that they can make whatever world they present to me compelling and meaningful. Um, it was just yeah. it it just really like it was it was a quite surprising. It was just I was not expecting the aesthetic of what I got, and it it made me a little bit unable to to take in what what else was in the trailer, which is again why I went back. And I agree with you. Like when I went back and rewatched it. I saw the pool game and I was like, I bet we can play pool. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I thought that yeah. same exact thing. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, we we will uh, we will be. I think both of us will be eager to see and hear more from Cyberpunk twenty. Yeah, no release date, unfortunately, not even a year or anything. Yeah, I mean, this game ain't coming out in February twenty nineteen. I don't think so. Bet your ass of that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to Bethesda. You know, Bethesda, which I I have to say again. Uh, my favorite E3 press conference, easily. Oh, oh my, so, my favorite. So that's interesting. I thought you were going to say the opposite, and I, and I want to say oh. that on the outside of this. So again, on, I was on the Discord server, and there was a lot of uh, negativity on on the site and on the Discord server about this press conference. They're um, all wrong. And, and I and I have to say, there was a point at which, during the press conference, I thought to myself, "Is it just me, or is it every year? Is it just Doom, Fallout, Wolfenstein, Elder Scrolls, Doom, Fallout, Wolfenstein, Elder Scrolls?" Yeah. And Those unreal franchises and yeah. unreal. Right. But, it, but it, for a minute there, I was thinking like, th- that's all they're doing. They're not doing anything else, but those like five things. And then, and then well, I realized until now, right. Then I realized I was wrong. And so I actually, <laughs> <laughs> boy, if only more human beings could have that experience that you just did <laughs> and, and talk about it. Yeah. Um, so I actually was very impressed with, with even though I'm not, uh, um, you know, listen, I, I played in love doom. I have loved Fallout at points in the past. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was fucking obsessed with Skyrim, and I absolutely love Wolfenstein. That's uh, Of all of those, it's probably the ones I've enjoyed the most in the last couple of years. Right. But for some reason, none of those games engender excitement in me, and I don't know why that is. Okay. Um, but but um, by the time I was done watching this, I thought that was a good press conference, and I thought Todd Howard just fucking knocked it out of the park. Yeah, he he really knows how to work a crowd. There's no doubt. Although well, some he of knows, the other people that were on stage did not. But, no, they uh, don't. And but he know it's not just that he knows how to work a crowd or, or present, which he does. I appreciate the fact that he seems like very comfortable in that role. Yeah. But he also brings the fucking goods. Like yeah, he, he knows absolutely. he knows what's going to be compelling, and he knows um, and and he, and he knows what's going to be surprising and endear his audience and bringing things like Fallout Shelter. It's for free and it's available today. Yeah. Or you know what I mean, like those kinds. That's a of good things. way. That's a good way to go with it. Fallout seventy six coming out in four months or five months. You know. Yeah. Uh, let's we'll get to Fallout seventy six in a minute because that's yeah. the one I think I really want to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, Rage two, uh, great, fine. It, that's not that's not one of the Bethesda games that I'm terribly excited about. Looks fun, you know, but I don't really have much more of a horse in the race. I do. Uh, I'm not. I'm probably not going to play it. Yeah, and I do want to say real quick about that, Brent, is that I, I, I had, I did not like Rage. I have been completely uninterested in everything I've seen from Rage up to this point. Yeah. The presentation they made at the press conference it piqued my interest enough that I will continue to watch the game. Okay. To me, to me, it looks like it could be, could be fun. Drop in, drop out, co op. Uh, it looks like I haven't done a lot of research on the game, um, but you know, so a little bit Borderlandsy in that way. Um, yeah. Uh, nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. So I thought I, I think they I give them good marks for what they presented at the press conference because it piqued my interest enough uh, to 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 bring me into a game that I formerly felt like I was pushed away from. Gotcha. Yep. Doom Eternal again. I like I didn't play the new Doom. I have you know I haven't played Doom since the old days, and you know it's just it's just not a game that I heard great great things about Doom, but in the grand scheme of what I can play. In the time that I have, it just never got into the pile. So, yep. bully, like great bully for Doom fans. Yeah, exactly. But it's just it's not something I'm going to play. Wolfenstein Youngblood was a little bit more interesting to me in the sense that 
number one, Blaskowitz's twin daughter. So female protagonists and the fact that there's two of them tells us all kinds of fun's going to happen in terms of co-op and all that stuff. I, I got to say that that definitely got my attention. That sounds like that could be a fun time. I agree. I, so I, I absolutely love the recent, um, the Wolfenstein franchises, although the, the DLC for the new Colossus was just absolutely fucking abysmal. Yeah. Um, but the game itself was fantastic. Uh, the old blood before that was okay. And then the new order, the, the, the original, um, uh, reboot was also just like one of the best games I've played in years. So uh, loving what they're doing with the franchise. I also love the fact that they're doing female protagonists. Uh, I appreciate there there were m- more female protagonists I think this year at E3 than I've seen before, which I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, I I think the title I can't believe the title they chose for anybody who's probably over thirty years old. If you don't think about Rob Lowe playing hockey when you see that. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what you do for people who don't know that movie. It's whatever, no big deal. But, but other than that, I cannot help think about Young Blood, the movie with Patrick Swayze right. and Rob Lowe. But, um, <laughs> and I will say during the trailer. So I love the idea of it being Blaskowitz's daughters. Um, yeah. I thought I think it's a really compelling idea. I really want Uncharted to to work with Nathan Drake's daughters. I think that idea, a daughter. I think that idea is uh, spoiler alert. I suppose. Um, <laughs> Too late now. Two years later, uh, while talking about Bethesda products. Um, also, it's set during the eighties, which is which is kind of a that, there's an interesting there's an interesting idea twist, there. Right. Nazis Nazis in the eighties. Yeah. So I love it. The one thing about it though that it that that was a little odd for me that I think is going to take some getting used to is B J Blaskowitz's voice and voiceover is so much a part of that game, and when I heard his daughter's voice. Um, it, it was it was very jarring, and, and I'm I'm I, I questioning if they chose the right actress uh, for that or not because that voiceover is so important. But but obviously it was just a tiny snippet. We'll have to see where it goes. But yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I I do I think the Wolfenstein games are some of the best straight up classic first person shooter type games that have been made in the last ten years. And hopefully, Young Blood is going to continue that trend. Yep. Um, okay, so obviously. We all know that Skyrim has been ported to every (laughs) device that you could play Skyrim on. Unless you've never considered playing Skyrim on the Amazon Alexa or on your smart fridge or on, you know, the the, the bit, the the bit with (laughs) Skyrim, very special edition being played on Alexa. That was, that was pretty funny. By Keegan, Michael key. Yeah. And that was, I, we, I just had to put that in here because it was fucking brilliant and absolutely hysterical and keegan michael it's just awesome yeah you haven't seen it twice as funny for the fact that bethesda are the ones doing it themselves that's right it's one thing if the onion comes along and does this that's funny but the fact that it's fucking bethesda that's doing this is brilliant this is the kind of shit that i'm talking about todd howard brings that he knows and and it's just and and they must have spent you know twenty thousand dollars making this or whatever or more i don't know what what you have to pay keegan michael key right now but yeah. um, you guys, if you have not seen it, go look up Skyrim Very Special Edition and watch it. It's one of the funniest gaming bits I've seen in a long time. Yeah, very. I, I mean, that's that's definitely that's the meme coming out of the Bethesda press conferences. That uh, that sketch. And I wish, I uh, wish, I wish more of the companies would bring content like that to these press conferences. Well, I wish more of the companies would bring good content like this to their press conferences. That's right be very very easy to mess something like this up all right very so do, do, Brent, are you do you want to talk about Fallout? are you even interested in fallout or i desperately want to talk about fallout 76 okay now i am not the biggest fallout fan i've not played the the, the recent fallout games you know like i never played new vegas and you know anything like that okay i thought fallout 4 looked really cool i didn't play fallout 4 i loved the base building mechanic of Fallout 4. I thought that looked like a lot of fun. It's, it's one of those things that I thought, oh, in my days when I had nothing but time on my hands, I would have gotten into that game. I would have really, really had a lot of fun with that. Um, I've not had a lot of fun, or excuse me, I've not had a lot of time as of late for for gaming in general. I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to play with the guys in almost two months, uh, which is a, a long fucking story. But the point is that Watching Fallout 4, you remember I talked about this with Anthem. I said, I'm looking for that moment where I'm like, oh, I want to have that experience with my friends. I got that watching stuff from Fallout 76. I want to have 
that experience of running around the wasteland of West Virginia, which is obviously redundant, and also base building, looting, raiding, all that stuff, uh, all that stuff that you know that we see those players do. I even I love the fucking photo mode. I love you know like where they're posing with you know the monster. I mean we like we have done stuff. Like, there's no mechanic for it, but we've done that exact thing in the division. Like after we you know conquered a you know particularly big operation or whatever in the division. Like you know we, like everybody posed for a picture. I'm gonna get a screenshot. Here it comes. Uh, so that really really got my attention. I I'm pretty excited about the prospect of playing fallout 76 in this online world and the specific mechanics they talked about it being online how that's going to work as far as the dedicated servers and all that but being able to play that game with friends seems like a good time to me i agree so i i was actually i'm kind of over fallout at this point again i played the last four of them i've never finished one of them um but uh so i went into this like just felt just really just completely not interested in fallout 76 just absolutely not interested and uh, I came out of it very interested. And oddly, it's because of the online world that you describe. And despite the fact that uh, randos on the, on servers tend to be assholes and the idea of, like, you know, choose to be aggressive or to partner up is, is almost laughable because it's almost impossible to partner up with a stranger. Although I will say that it has happened to me in games like DayZ or, yeah. um, or PUBG or whatever. And... Uh, not PUBG, but uh, games like Daisy. And when it does happen, it's actually quite compelling to meet another human being and be like, oh my God, there are halfway fucking decent people out there who would actually consider working together. Um, but I actually, I too, I like that idea. I, I, it, it, and, I, and I also appreciate the fact that they said, you know, we're talking about dozens of people on a server, not hundreds. So, yes. you know, it's not like you're constantly going to be bombarded with assholes trying to, to pick you off. But that, um, and that uh, might make people feel a little bit more chill. But that you have to always be aware of them as well, which I think is interesting. Right, um, I right. do want to know more about, you know, the, I, I'm, I want to know more about how it looked like it was challenging to get a hold of the nuclear weapons. I want to know more about getting a hold of the nuclear weapons, so it's not just people like nuclear weapons spamming the map and fucking destroying <laughs> it over and over. Um, yeah, hope, hopefully it's a uh, it's a little bit more of a rare occurrence. And I want to go. I want to know more about the details of what you do lose when you get killed by somebody else. Right. So you know, do you lose everything that you have been you know working for or that sort of thing? And so, but other than that, yeah, it, it really interested me when I found out it was an all online experience. And so I am I am now intrigued again. Well, you know, I, I I mean, I've got to I got to get a hold of the guys. We got to put the band back together because Fort You Suckers must be built. It must <laughs> it must happen. Um, um all right. So, in I, the interest yeah, of time. Yeah, let's let's we should skip probably Ubisoft. move off cuz we Oh, you Oh, no, 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 no. No, we can't skip Ubisoft. Okay. Well, what I'll do go, you want to say about Ubisoft? I'll go through it very quickly. Okay. Beyond, I'll sit here and listen. Beyond Good and Evil 2. I have no idea what the first game was about or how, what even what kind of game it was, but I am so compelled by the stuff I'm seeing about it. I immediately signed up for the beta. That's number okay. one. Number two, Trials Rising. I fucking love Trials games. I've heard uh, that. We, you and I interviewed the guys at Red Links. We did. Um, back in the day, and they were fantastic. And so they I'm were. really excited about a new Trials game. Um, Skull and Bones, a pirate game I don't care about, but... There it's it is. okay. I've got Sea of Thieves to scratch that itch. Oh, and by the way, the Sea of Thieves uh, expansion they were talking about, the uh, the new stuff coming to Sea of Thieves at Microsoft, two thumbs up. Are Moving you on. playing Sea of Thieves? I'm not. Uh, that was the last thing I played before. See, okay, so like real quickly, what happened is everything was going along, humming along, playing with the guys, you know, having a lot of fun. We were playing Sea of Thieves, and I got an ear infection. I like went and visited family four days, came back. I had an ear infection. And I started getting vertigo as a result of the ear infection. And one of the things that triggered the vertigo was playing video games. And I had to completely cut myself off from playing video games while I had this ear infection. And it took me about six weeks to get over the ear infection. So I've been fine. I've been feeling fine for, uh, for about a month now. But the problem is that my daughter is like now, like I'm officially booked every fucking day of the week with parkour lessons and swim lessons and library trips, you know, like that kind of stuff. So like I've officially hit like a busy dad period, but I'm hoping that it's going to cool down a little, you know, in a few weeks after the swim lessons in, after this session's over, I'm hoping to get back into some shit, but dude, I haven't touched it. I haven't touched a game 
in two fucking months because of illness and now just being fucking busy. Yeah, well, I mean, if there's if there's any good reason not to be playing, it's because it's your daughter to be with your daughter. Yes, yes. Um, which I, I mean, you know, I would choose that anyway. But I didn't know you were playing Sea of Thieves. That's interesting. Uh, so I loved if, Sea of Thieves. If we were doing shows, we could be talking about stuff like this. I know, and um, we got to talk about God of War too. I know. Blah blah blah. Uh, anyway. So, so the one other thing I wanted to talk about in the Ubisoft conference. Two things. No Aisha Tyler, which I think ends up being a good thing. Um, uh, and um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, so if you haven't watched Assassin's Creed Odyssey stuff, go watch it. So as you all know, if you've listened to any show we've ever done before, I have played and not finished every Assassin's Creed game. <laughs> and and <laughs> swear to God, I will never buy another one and then buy every one of them when they come out. Um, Assassin's Creed Origins, which is the most recent set in Egypt, um, has been fantastic. It's it was a change in the combat mechanics, a change in the world building. It was huge. It's gorgeous. I've really enjoyed Assassin's Creed Origins, although I have not come close to finishing it. Um, AC Odyssey looks so it's set in ancient Greece. Uh, it looks like it is uh, built off the same engine, so it looks phenomenally gorgeous. But uh, it looks also like they're deepening the RPG aspects of it significantly. Uh, and adding some different functionality, there were some very large battles, large scale battles um, that I thought were interesting. Spartan battles. Also, you can choose at the beginning to play one of two protagonists, one male and one female, uh, which I think is fantastic. And they, I saw a demo uh, where the female character was being played, and, and uh, she was badass. It was awesome. Looks like the combat's even a little bit more refined. Uh, so I'm actually excited for this man. It comes out October 5th. So this is so. So this game comes out October fifth, and and I'm I, I may not buy Odyssey at the uh, on launch, but I can tell already I'll be buying it. It looks like a, a, just a, another improvement and iteration on Assassin's Creed Origin, uh, Origins, which was already a, a fantastic game. Um, this comes out October fifth. We talked about um, February fourteenth is oh, excuse me, February fourteenth. November fourteenth is Fallout seventy six. Also in October, in early to mid-October, I can't remember the date off the top of my head, is Battlefield Five, And then mm-hmm. obviously October 26th or 9th, I can't remember, is Red Dead Redemption. Uh, so, so we're going to have a busy fall, is it, what you're telling me. Yeah, it's going to be a busy fall. So I don't know when I'll play this game, but it looks really, really good. And if you're at all interested in Assassin's Creed, or if maybe you haven't been historically, but you played Origins and really liked it, I highly recommend looking at Odyssey. It looks very, very good. All right, and that's so, my Ubisoft spiel. Yeah, and you know, on, I have not had a chance to go back and watch the Ubisoft press conference, and, and honestly, I mean, that's the one I really want to watch because, I, I mean, in in the course of the last year, I've played more Ubisoft games than fucking anything between Division, Ghost Recon Wildlands, and Rainbow Six Siege. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much an Ubisoft puppet at this yeah, point. Yeah, and there was some update in the conference, Brent, about Rainbow Six Siege. I came into the conference Ooh. about 15, 20 minutes late. So I missed the Rainbow Six Siege, and, and I don't know off the top. Of my, I, I didn't get a chance to go back and read it. but It's probably just whatever they're doing next season. Yeah, but if you're it. interested, I, I definitely worth going back, because they did talk about Rainbow Six. All right, cool. All right, so let's talk about Sony, because we, we got we to gotta cover Sony, and there's definitely some things worth covering. I think it was a stark contrast between Sony and Microsoft's press events this year. Sony's was very, very... Uh, I mean, it's not like it was low-key in the sense that there weren't a lot of people there but just the setting and sort of the format that they had some live musical performances that led into uh, certain things that they showed off with gameplay and stuff it was a very different sort of press conference uh for e3 yeah so if you watch they basically took over a city block and built this little like Sony E3 theme park thing. They did this weird thing where they started out, which I thought was both good and bad in a way. They they started out in this building. I don't know what the building was that was decorated, although you didn't know it at the time, was decorated to uh, match the trailer that it was going to lead into the gameplay which trailer. Which was The Last for, of Us. The Last of Us. And yeah. um uh and, and then what they did was they so they went through the Last of Us, which I thought was really compelling. I thought it was super cool that when, when the game trailer started, it looked like the interior of the place where the crowd was. I thought that was really fucking cool. Yeah. Um, what they then did was cut to uh, four guys at a desk while they moved the entire audience to another building yes, to move on was, to the next game. That that was... I, I, for a second, I thought, they're not going to be changing buildings every game, are I they? Actu- I actually thought they were. And, and while I that idea is really cool, like, again, it was really compelling to see the people in the on the way basically the set 
of the game they were about to show. Yeah. But had they done even that one time, I felt it was disruptive, and it was they shouldn't. I give them kudos for trying something new, but I, right. I don't think they should do it moving forward. I um, agree. It was very <laughs> it was very disruptive and really interrupted the tone and the, the tenor of the press well, conference. But if they yeah. can come up with a way to do that without changing buildings, well, a augmented reality. They sh- like everybody put on your AR glasses. Now you're inside. You know the set from The Last of Us. You know now you're in. You know, now you're in this uh, this temple from uh, Ghost of Tsushima, you know, Ghost yeah. of Tsushima and uh, mechanically it was a little bit weird, but but yeah, um, and I'll give them that. But again, I do, I give them credit for trying to do something different. Every fucking press conference is somewhat the same year over year over year over year, right? And so I, I'm not opposed to them trying, and if it, you you know you, you yeah, fail, good you fail for trying, right? You did, but you did fail, okay. But, so, but Brent, thanks for trying. But let's talk about that Last of Us two, and, and I would like to start if you don't mind. Um, Go ahead. Talking about the Last of Us two because you know that I fucking hated the Last of Us. Yes, and uh, you were terribly wrong for it. I'm the only ahead. person on the planet, and I even bought it again and tried to play it again. Yeah, and I just f- found that game to be boring and not compelling. And I know well, I'm, I'm the only one on the planet. Yeah. Um, that being said. I was fucking blown away. And I so I had no interest in this trailer at all. It was the right. one thing at Sony that I was like, oh, who cares? Like, you know, get through it. I was blown away by this trailer, Brent. It, 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 far beyond my imagination. And for for many, many reasons, not not the the least of which was uh the what looks to be a, the, the the protagonist is a young gay female. Right. Um yeah. which I think is fucking awesome. Um so so number one there was that and i give if that is in fact the case and even if it's not i give them a tremendous amount of kudos for um uh, bringing a lead gay character into a game like that first of all or at least somebody who's exploring their sexuality yeah. number two um when it transitioned into the gameplay um the fucking gameplay was insane the, yeah the, I, and i don't just mean brutal i mean i mean complex and fluid and incredibly well animated and um i, I just I, I mean i i was just i was floored yeah i i think that uh i i think that there's a number of things about it that that really stood out to me okay so number one the fact that we're seeing ellie again years later i mean you know she's no longer you know a, a kid now she's now she's a woman but the point is is that she didn't need anybody's help anymore like you know Ellie, you know, she's a one, she's a one person slaughterhouse. And the fact that the, the whole sort of hitch to that beat between her and I can't remember the character's name, but you know, her, her girlfriend or, you know, whatever her significant other. Um, but the beat between them, they're, they're kind of, you know, talking about, you know, everybody's staring at us. Well, you know, well, you know, why do you think that is? And it ultimately kind of comes down to, as we see you know, in this gameplay flashback, which I thought was a really cool device, by the way. Um, but they're talking about people being afraid of Ellie because she is she is a formidable warrior, and I thought that that was something that's kind of interesting. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that's kind of like you know bandied about, um, both sincere and otherwise about. Uh, you know, respecting women and admiring women and all that. But the thing that w- I thought was a little bit unique about this is that, you know, they are presenting a, you know, not necessarily all that imposing a figure in Ellie at this dance. And yet they are showing that she is a very, very dangerous person, uh, you know, to, to those people, uh, those people out in the world, the Raiders and stuff that she's encountering. The fact that they're talking about fearing Ellie I thought it was was kind of an interesting uh, twist. I don't know that I've seen a game quite do that before, uh, it, w- with you know with with this uh, with a character. So yeah. anyway, I thought that was very interesting. I'm I love The Last of Us. I'm dying to see where they take the story with uh, with Ellie. However many years later uh, this uh, this ends up being, I'm very very interested to see where things go and just kind of pick it up again i don't have any of the reservations about the first one that you did i loved it and i'm dying to play this one yeah me i'm, I'm really excited for this game now some of the, some of the mechanic I, i'm just curious to see more some of the mechanical stuff 
that I didn't love about the first one. They seem to have just overhauled the combat system uh, yeah. significantly. So I, I'm very excited. I, I really, really was impressed by this trailer. Right. Um, another trailer that I was really impressed with, and you and I, we talked about this a bit before E3. We talked about this a week or two ago, is Ghosts of Tsushima. And that that gameplay is everything that I hoped it would be and more. I am very, very into playing this game as soon as possible. Yeah, I, me too. So me too. My, probably my biggest disappointment of all of E3 is that there wasn't any kind of release window announced for this game. Yeah. Um, and likewise for The Last of Us and likewise for Death Stranding. Um, that bummed me out. I do wish also for all three of those games, Sony talked about getting into doing, they basically s- set it up so that the press conference they told us was going to be a deep dive into The Last of Us, Ghost of Tsushima, uh, Death Stranding, and Spider-Man. I-, I wish those dives had been deeper than they were. They were six, seven yeah. minute, eight minute um, gameplay demos, which is fucking great. But I actually thought I wanted also a dev on stage afterwards talking a little bit about mechanics or about um, systems or worlds, right. or I would have liked a little but bit we're, more. We are, d- d- just to be clear, we are getting that, I think, today. Well, I mean, like, even after the press conference, you know, they, they had, uh, they had, you know, two of the guys that were talking about Spider Man. They were going over about Spider Man, which footage. is the game that comes out in a few months. Yeah, I don't know my, if that's true of Tsushima. I know that there are, there are things on their schedule today, Tuesday. There are things like on their live stream schedule. We may be getting some of that today. Okay, which would be great. So, so I, Brent, I, I, I have, I have such a fucking hard on for this game. Honestly, I, I of all the games at E three, this is probably my most excited. Uh, yeah. Um. I, it was. I mean, just stunningly beautiful. Yeah. Um. I love that. That's the stealth gameplay. I love the samurai gameplay. There were a couple of things about the game that I, in this trailer I didn't love. Um. I I didn't like the animation, the running animation. Um. With the horse? No, no, no. Him running on foot looked super okay. gamey to me. There are a few things I was that... going to say. I, I thought the stuff on horse looked really cool. No, actually. the horse looked good, good to me too. There, so there were a few things. So the game is like in, just insanely cinematic. Yes. In in a world that I have spent almost no time in in video games, um, there were a few things that pulled me out of it that were a little gamey. Like during the stealth, the highlighting of the people below, the right. way they chose to do that felt gamey to me. The um. The, the the animation when he ran and then I think um I don't know if you noticed but a couple of times he repeated that animation of pulling the sword casually out of his victim um which, which looked awesome the first time but then he did it immediately the next time he made a kill so I'm hoping there'll be more variety uh like that and they'll sort of tune that up to make that look as cinematic and and beautiful as as the the landscape does yes um but other than that um i you know th- this i've already watched the trailer twice and it's i just cannot wait to get into this world and i really really had hoped that they would give us some sort of like spring 2019 yeah. summer 2019 kind of if only yeah, if only yeah um my bottom line from watching the gameplay here at uh, at sony's e3 press event was red dead redemption in feudal japan there's even moments that feel like gunslinger mode from Red Dead, you know, where where the, the the main character is is facing off with somebody else. There's a little bit of like a slow mo kind of thing, and uh, you know, where they're just dashing at each other, and he's hacking with the sword. Um, the the stealth elements immediately took me back to old school Tenshu on yep. the original PlayStation, absolutely, and how much I fucking loved that game. And, uh, the, the, the open world, I mean, even, you know, just the, the drama of what we're seeing unfold, the Mongol invasion of Japan, but you know, that's the, those are not the only enemies to contend with as we see in this gameplay demo. Uh, I mean, they've got me, I mean, they have, they have got me hook, line and sinker already. Uh, I'm just waiting for them to tell me where I can throw my money. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So there's a couple other games, Brent, we're going to talk about death stranding and we're going to talk about Spider-Man, the other two sort of yeah. pillars of this, but there were a couple other games I just want to mention that came out uh, that were announced, which I thought was interesting, actually, because they kept saying over and over, like, we're focusing on these four games, don't expect big announcements, and then all of a sudden, there were these big announcements, and <laughs> I, <thought that> <laughs> I thought that was actually quite smart of them. So Managing expectation. Um, a new game called Control, which is the next Remedy game, 
Um, right. The thing that I thought was meaningful about that was number one, I didn't know what the fuck I was watching while it was happening. Yeah, um, it was very, it was very, very surreal. And I thought to myself, this feels like a Remedy game, but for the last however many years, eight whatever years, uh, Remedy has had a deal with Microsoft. So uh, with Alan Wake and with um, uh, yeah. Quantum Break, and so it's kind, of, it's quite interesting that Remedy decided to debut this game with PlayStation. So that was of note. Um, yeah. The Nio Two. Um, which I, I never played the original Nio, but I know there are I didn't either. big fans of that, and so that was uh, announced here as well. And then uh, the Resident Evil 2 remake, um, which is, uh, I don't know that I ever played Resident Evil 2. I'm not sure. I don't think I came to the Resident Evil series till till later, like around 5, I think. Yeah. Um, but um, people have been clamoring for a Resident Evil 2 remake. Guess uh, what? And, and I got to say, it looked really good. Um, it did. It looked really good, and and I have to say, I mean, I'm not the biggest Resident Evil. Play. I played the I played the early games. I played like one and two and stuff. Uh, and as somebody who has not, I don't have a great deal of nostalgia for the franchise exactly. But I have to say that even even I got a little tickle uh, watching uh, watching this and and kind of realizing like, oh shit, it's it's RE2. That's crazy. And it did. It, it looked pretty cool. So, yeah, and it looked. Brent, am I wrong? Him. But it looks like it, it doesn't. It, it 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 looks like a complete remake of the game. Like a, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, like they've they've they remade the game from the ground up. Not like they upgraded the existing game. No, but, I mean it, to me, it looks like a it looks like a, a complete rebuild. Yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm excited to to see where that goes. But um, all right, so let's talk about the the third of the four pillars, and that's Death Stranding. Okay, uh, you know. I, I guess I got to say at the onset, um, I have stopped. I have stopped arrogantly assuming that I can either understand <laughs> or critique Hideo Kojima as as a game developer. I, as you will know, if you are one of the six people who's listened for a while and are still listening, um, I have said things in the past. I have leveled criticisms against uh, Mr. Kojima. Kojima-san, and I have uh, I have second guessed him, and uh, and in almost every instance, it's turned out that uh, Hideo Kojima was right and Brent Adams was wrong. So humbled uh, by this experience, I am just going to say that Death Stranding looks like a Hideo Kojima game, and thus far, I have loved pretty much every Hideo Kojima game I've ever played. So. Despite the fact that I have watched gameplay of this and still know nothing of what it means, what it's going to involve, or what the fuck is going on, I'm there. I'm I'm there, Kojima-san. So somebody in our Discord chat rightly uh, pointed out that essentially they believe this game to be Hideo Kojima's Sherpa Simulator, <laughs> uh, which I thought was a fairly apt description. Um, yeah, nicely, nicely played. I did read. Uh, I did read a little bit more about the game after watching twice the, um, the trailer or the gameplay trailer that they had showed. Um, so first of all, what a fucking beautiful game! Obviously, um, both, yep it it looks good both visually and sort of aesthetically overall. Um, uh, you know, apparently it literally is Norman Reedus's character is a porter. His name is Sam Porter Bridges. He is right. a guy who who delivers things. Um, as he tells us. As he tells us. That's exactly right. Um, we did find out the Bionic Woman is in the game. Um, Dude, Lindsay Wagner showing up. I, I mean, <laughs> I think you got to be of a certain age for that to mean as much to you as it meant to me. Right. I, 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 when I saw Wagner, that, I was like, I'm sorry, what? What? What decade are we in? That's, sign me the fuck up. That's awesome. Dude, I, yeah. so I, don't, I don't, also don't know what the fuck is going on in this game, um, but I am so intrigued by just the utter fucking weirdness um that this game is in the most beautiful way it, it's yeah it's it's uh, i mean I, i'm just mesmerized at every piece of media he puts out about it i don't believe this gives me any more insight as to what the that that, that it even is a video game who knows <laughs> M- maybe he's showing us all of the 45 minute cutscenes that he plans on putting in the game i don't even know it could um, be a lot more than 45 minutes if, uh, uh if previous Metal Gear games are, t- are any uh, measure. Indication, that's right, yeah. I, you know, speaking of Metal Gear, there's one thing I wanted to point out, and I don't know if you had this experience as well, but I tell you, something about the 
something about the animation. There's one scene where you see Norman Reedus's character, Sam. Yep. Uh, crawling up the the uh, this sort of like rocky you know bit of uh, bit of this this mountain that he's he's summiting, I suppose. And he's got you know this equipment on his back. He's got like this this pack or whatever it is that he's carrying. And there's just this one there's this one moment where he's kind of scrambling up this little bit of rocky terrain and dude i like it just it looked so much like phantom pain to me i I don't know if it's something about like just the way that they like to do their their animation or maybe they're using like maybe it's like the same motion capture artist that uh did the motion capture for this and did it for phantom pain but there was just this moment i was watching it and i was like oh shit like that looks exactly like you know snake in uh in phantom pain yep uh, I don't know, but and even even a little bit of like the outfit. And I suppose that uh, some of it maybe just down to the game engine, and that you know they've they've built the engine for this game the way they've built previous engines, and you know therefore it has resemblance. But even just the like the way the character looks on screen, I guess maybe the scale of of the character in relation to the environment and all the stuff he was carrying, it uh, I could kind of squint my eyes and see uh, see boss from from Phantom Pain. Yeah, there's no question. I'm sure there's similarities, but uh, it was a very interesting trailer for sure. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm dying to I'm dying to see more, but even more than that, I'm dying to understand what the yeah, fuck's going. I agree 100. percent I just I just want more is all. I just want more. Um, yeah. All right, Brent. So to uh, wrap it up, the last game that I think we need to talk about is a game. I don't even. I'm not sure if you're even interested in this game, but um, <laughs> they did bring out some more Spider-Man for us. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of interested in Spider-Man as it turns out, I am a little bit interested in Insomniac Spider-Man game. Um, I remember us seeing this, I guess it was last year. We, we saw a, we saw a gameplay demo. Actually, we did see some gameplay from this last year and it, um, it impressed me then, and man, oh man, is it impressing me now. Um, I, I am over the fucking moon. I think that this game looks... Like, honestly, what this game looks like to me is it looks like a combination of maybe my favorite two Spider-Man games ever, which is the original Spider-Man on the PlayStation from Neversoft, and then Spider-Man 2, the... Like the adaptation of the Spider-Man Two film, the Sam Raimi film, uh, but that Spider-Man Two game that uh, that was done by uh, I think it was done by Treyarch on the PlayStation Two. This game looks like a combination of those two games, and to me, that is maybe the most exciting prospect imaginable because that original NeverSoft game had so much of the flavor and tone of the comics, and and they really nailed. Spidey's rogues gallery and his personality and all the different kind of techniques that he could do with his web shooters, his powers and all that. And then the Spider-Man two game, the Treyarch game what that game absolutely excelled at was creating as primitive as it was by modern standards, but they created the entire Island of Manhattan in game and that freedom of movement you had to just swing around the city and explore. I mean, my wife and I played like we never even like did missions. We would just sit there and just explore and sightsee. And just that mechanic of swinging through the city was so compelling and fluid by itself that you could just play that part of it and be happy. And so seeing how much they're focusing on those two elements in, in this game, uh, I, I think it could be amazing. Yeah, I mean, for me, honestly, the only question right now is am I buying the collector's edition for 150 freaking dollars to get the statue, which yeah. they still have not revealed the entirety of, uh, or am I just buying the standard version? I don't buy a collector's edition so much anymore. I've gotten burned too many times. I'm, you know, I, I mean, just, if, it's, if you get it and it's good, please tell me, but I'll probably get the standard. I, I'm just all about the statues, but, but, um, yeah, man, the game looks incredible. And I really love, I just love the, I, 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 you know, it, it feels like Batman meets funny to me. You know what I mean? But yeah. with all with all the awesome, like, like in terms of the combat, it feels Batman-y. Oh, uh, it does. It, it looks so in the, good. In the, in the best possible way, but with all of the Spider-Man, yeah. like, web-slinging and that sort of stuff and smart-ass comments as he's going through it. It could be so good, dude. I, like, I, I, I'm so excited. I'm trying to kind of, like, back off a little bit and say, like, you know, don't get too invested, you know, because, you know, Assassin's Creed combat looked good to you, too, and look how that worked out. Yeah, right, But, I know. dude, if it, if it 
feels as much like Batman combat as it looks like Batman combat, th- they've got it. I mean, they, but, and then on top of that, on top of that, web swinging around the world, which is yes, something that exactly. Batman didn't had, didn't it had. I mean, it, it it had the grapple and the and the flying, but I don't think but that's, it's not the it's, same. It's not as compelling a movement system, quite no. quite as compelling a movement system. I don't think as as being <laughs> web swinging around. I know, very exciting. I would like to. It's interesting that they made that the fourth pillar. Three games that that ostensibly have no release date, and this game that's coming out in just a couple of months, which yeah. I, which I thought was interesting. Um, I, I feel like they don't have to do much more to sell that game, honestly. No, um, you know, it, I mean, they, I mean, like they don't. Like I don't have any. I mean, there's nothing else that I need. I mean, they got my money. I'm buying fucking Spider Man. I can't wait to play that. Um, I didn't come out of this year's E3 feeling uh, disappointed as I have uh, in in some E3s past. But I didn't come out of it, uh, you know, feeling like, you know, like, yeah, gaming's back, baby. Or like gaming went anywhere. But, you know, it's just, I don't know. I felt really good about a few things. But uh, but overall, my E3 press conference experience was, uh, I, I think it was it was right about average. Uh, then, and there, and, but that was sort of dotted by a few really, really standout trailers or gameplay demos or, you know, things that got me very very excited yeah what about you yeah i agree man i mean i i think that uh, there were so many leaks ahead of time that there were things that 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 just were not surprises that i that that would have been fun to have been surprises um right. even the division two the location was leaked the day or two before because of the banner they had put up and yeah um and so i would have liked a few more surprises in that regard the ones that i did get the just cause for the dying light too i was very very um happy about um uh, also, you know, the things I did get deeper dives into that I wasn't necessarily expecting to love or be too into, like Assassin's Creed Odyssey or The Last of Us was also very pleasantly surprising. And then yeah. some of the things I was really looking forward to, like uh, Ghost of Tsushima and Death Stranding and Spider-Man were uh, proved proved out to be um, what I had hoped they would be. Battlefield Five for me also, I was really happy to see some of that information. Um, the, the one thing that I, I would have liked a little bit more of was release dates. I felt like uh, this particular E3 um, was devoid of a lot of release dates, on at least on the stuff that I cared about, right. um, uh, with a with, uh, few exceptions. But I also would have liked to have seen a little bit more on Cyberpunk. Other than just that trailer, I would have liked to have gotten maybe some oh, yeah. some of CD Projekt Red talking about where they're at with the game. And, and, oh, that would have been great. You know, some, of the, some of the mechanics of the world or whatever. But, uh, but overall, I thought, it, I thought it was a good E3. I, I, was, less, I was less blown away by things. But the, the amount of content, when you look back and you look through the docket and you look at all the things, all the games we talked about in the show, there were a ton of really good games uh, that yeah. we got a lot of information on. And so, so I think it was good content-wise, maybe, maybe a little less exciting uh, presentation-wise, but good content-wise. And I'm excited to see more of the details we get out in the next couple of days as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And actually, there was there's something I just realized that we forgot. I forgot to explain that uh, that unfunny joke at the top. Uh, two things that we forgot to mention from the Bethesda press event is at the end of Todd Howard's bit at the Bethesda presser, they did something kind of interesting and they talked very briefly about two games that they're working on. One of which is an entirely new franchise for them called Starfield. Oh yes, that's which, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, just the, you know, the idea of Bethesda doing something related to either either space exploration or and or science fiction because we don't really know that much about what the setting or time frame would be but uh that was that was an evocative kind of trailer it really kind of stirred my imagination as to what they could do and then also the announcement that they are in fact currently working on the elder scrolls 6 that's a, that's a pretty big fucking deal so, it, it is absolutely brent you know i did want to throw in one more thing too i, I was able to during the show look up some information and yeah. found out that the Origin uh, Access Premier Pass, uh, which they're launching this summer, is going to cost fourteen ninety nine a month or a hundred dollars ninety nine ninety nine, a hundred dollars a year, and will include um, uh, the ability to play I be- to play day and date Madden NFL nineteen, FIFA nineteen, Battlefield five, and Anthem at launch. So if you think about that, if it's a hundred dollars for the year, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, if if there's if there's at least two games in that list that you want to play, probably you're you're probably wise to go ahead and just get a year of. Yeah, it. so it's a really really interesting idea. 
Yeah, it is. Uh, let's. We'll have to investigate that more and uh, may- maybe talk about that. That's that's uh, definitely a topic of discussion that we should revisit. Uh, indeed. All right, man. Well, it's been uh, just awesome as usual doing a show with you, my friend. Hell yeah, man! It's so so great to see you and chat with you. Again. Indeed, we have to. I have to apologize to our listeners and just that Brent, Brent and I are both have young children now. Uh, my daughter is seven months old. Brent's daughter is three. Three. My daughter is four and a half. Four and a half. Oh my god! And so a I very think, a very precocious. I four think and we half are struggling not only to find time to play games right now, but certainly to find time to record. But we will try not and let it, try not to let it be so long if we can in the future because I really enjoy doing this and hopefully you guys really enjoy it listening to it yeah it's been fantastic thank you so much man all right thank you and with that we will call it a show we hope everybody enjoyed e3 2018 and as always we invite you guys please comment on the show let us know what your thoughts are on anything in gaming or anything we talked about today and remember you don't stop playing because you get old you get old because you stop playing